So the first part of chapter five, we talked about inflammation. And um, one of the uh, signs of inflammation that you can test for that we talked about was the increase of fibrinogen and um, prothrombin, which are part of the clot process. So um, that actually starts to get into the healing process. So once you have a wound that has to heal, um, the healing of a wound can um, happen in a lot of different ways. And a lot of times it has to do with what type of wound it is, um, the how much tissue damage there is, and the type of resolution that we get. So we're going to talk about it. So resolution is um, usually minimal tissue damage. So I think of this as a paper cut. <laughs> so you, you get a paper cut, there's minimal tissue damage, it hurts like heck, you get some localized inflammation maybe, and then in a couple days later it's resolved and there's not a scar or anything because there's minimal tissue damage. Um, so the damaged cells recover and the tissue returns to normal within a short period of time. So a sunburn is considered minimal tissue damage um, and um, a paper cut, that sort of thing. So small wounds resolve without any um, ill effects. So regeneration um, is where the damaged tissue is replaced with cells that are functional. So um, basically by functional, they mean the cells are capable of mitosis. So some types of cells like epithelial cells um, in your skin and organ linings are constantly replicating um, whereas other ones, um, like our different organ cells and that sort of thing, they're able to undergo mitosis when it's necessary, but they're not constantly regenerating. So um, in the areas where that you have cells that are capable of mitosis, the damage, damaged tissue is replaced by identical tissue from the proliferation of nearby cells. So um, sometimes if the... If the or organs are arranged, the cells are arranged in a very complex way, and they call they're um, organized basically. So if you have a complex tissue organization like in the kidney and in the liver, um, sometimes um, with this type of healing with regeneration, the um, tissue is altered. So with liver disease um, is a good example. There's a really um, complex organization of tissues. And you get um, nodules of new cells, but they don't contribute to the overall function of liver because they are not in the right place. They're not organized correctly. So um, people, liver damage regenerates pretty easily, but you, people don't always regain full function of their liver. So depending on where the uh, regeneration is, it could be functional tissue that's doing you good and it could not be. Um, in the skin, because the epithelial cells are constantly regenerating, you can get um, functional areas of regeneration and in the um, inside the gut and that sort of thing. So replacement is where um, functional tissue is replaced by scar tissue and you do get loss of function with that. So um, scar or fibrous tissue formation takes place when there's extensive tissue damage or you have cells that are incapable of mitosis, like in the brain or in the heart. Um, so the wound area has to be filled in and covered by some form of tissue. So with chronic inflammation or um, complications like infection, they tend to result in more um, fibrous material. So um, there's a great um, diagram in the book on page 77, and I have the two parts of it here. But we talk about healing by first intention versus healing by second intention. And I've actually seen board exams asking you, like show you a picture of a wound, board exam question, sorry. They show you a picture of a wound and they ask you um, which of the following answers best describes the healing in this wound or something like that. And what, then the choices are, oh, the wound is healing by first intention, the wound is healing by second intention, you know, whatever the different things. And I, on my board exam, when I took the board exam, that's really the only question that I um, actually really remember. <laughs> there was a question with a picture of a wound, and they, they said, which of these best describe the following wound? And I don't know if I got that one right or not, <laughs> but 
they ask you to, to assess a wound. So wound care is part of physical therapy, um, even though I've never personally done uh, wound care, but um, it is considered part of um, our lexicon of knowledge and so it's something you have to know about. Um, so this is the diagram, and it's kind of small here, but look on page 77 in the book and you'll see it. But healing by first intention is the process that's involved when a wound is clean and free of foreign material and it doesn't have any necrotic tissue and the edges are held close together, which creates a minimal gap between the edges. So this is what you usually see with surgical incisions or it's often seen with surgical incisions because it was a clean wound made by a sterile instrument and the edges are closely approximated. So in this picture, they have that little black um, crescent up at the top that is indicating a suture that's holding the wound together. So um, it's the um, scab is small, the suture holds the ends together, um, you get blood clotting right around the area and the, the inflammation is limited, and you get good um, granulation tissue and epithelial growth, and, you, um, and the scar is pretty small, that you, um, res the resulting scar is pretty small. So healing by second intention um, refers to a situation where there's a large break in the tissue and then because of the consequences of that large break there's more inflammation and a longer healing period and more scar tissue forms. So um, the example they give in the book is that a compound fracture would heal this way. So you have a bigger scab, um, more inflammation, the sides of the wound are not as closely approximated so you you get regenerate, uh, regeneration of the epithelium, but you also get scar tissue to fill in the area. Um, so you get that scar tissue forms and then the tissue contracts um, to close up the wound, basically. So um, basically it's whether the wound is um, small and the edges are closely approximated or it's um, bigger and covers more area and potential complications. So um, in the book, on that same page, on page 77, they have two boxes. One of them is factors promoting healing and the other is factors delaying healing. So um, those are nice to know, like youth, good nutrition, um, adequate hemoglobin, effective circulation, a clean undisturbed wound, and no infection or further trauma. Those all promote healing. Um, things that delay healing are advanced age because we have reduced mitosis, poor nutrition and dehydration, um, anemia, that's low hemoglobin, so we don't have oxygen coming to the area or as much, circulatory problems, chronic diseases like metabolic diseases such as diabetes, diabetes slows down healing. Um, so presence of other disorders such as diabetes or cancer, Irritation, bleeding, or excessive mobility. So if you keep breaking open the wound, it's going to delay healing. Um, infection, foreign material, or exposure to radiation. Chemotherapy treatment, so cancer treatments can delay healing. And prolonged use of glucocorticoids. That is one of the side effects of glucocorticoids. So um, that's important. So with scar formation, um, you often get loss of function because you, you get loss of normal cells and specialized structures like hair follicles, nerves, and receptors. I always say scar tissue is the spackle of our body. When you um, fix a little hole in your wall, you put all that spackle in, and then you file it down and you paint it. But it's not the same as the, the um, material around it. It's different. And it's probably a weaker spot in the wall at that point. So scar tissue can cause contractures and obstructions. Scar tissue is non-elastic. It doesn't stretch like the tissue around it, and it can restrict range of movement. Um, adhesions are bands of scar tissue joining two surfaces that are normally separated. So a lot of times when someone has um, abdominal surgery, different kinds of surgeries, you can get um, adhesions between different organs and that sort of thing. So it basically it joins two things that are normally not joined and it can affect uh, function. So hypertrophic scar tissue is an overgrowth of fibrous tissue and it leads to hard ridges of scar tissue or keloid formation. So this picture is a picture of a keloid scar. 
Keloid scars are generally, um, some people are more prone to forming keloid scars. It has to do with your own individual body chemistry rather than um, something that happened to you. Um, so I've been told, and I don't have a resource on this, I've been told by um, physicians that red-headed, fair-skinned people tend to form larger ridges of scar tissue. So that's hearsay. <laughs> unless you can find a reference on it. I'll try to find a reference on it, but I thought it was interesting. So um, with an ulceration, the blood supply can be in, impaired around the scar and it results in further tissue breakdown and potentially ulceration at a future time. So just tissue damage makes bigger scars, if you want to think of it that way. So um, burns are a particular type of injury that can cause extensive scarring. So um, I've actually seen a lot of um, burn questions on board exams as well, so it's a good thing to be familiar with and go over. Um, burns can be thermal, meaning caused by flames or hot fluids. They can be chemical, uh, caused by radiation, caused by electricity, caused by light like sunburns, or caused by friction, like rope burns. So um, burns can cause a lot of tissue damage and create a lot of inflammation, and they have complicated healing. So um, burns used to be classified uh, first, second, and third degree, but now they, first, second, third, and fourth degree, but now they talk about superficial partial thickness, deep partial thickness, and full thickness. And it has to do with which tissues are affected. So superficial partial thickness burns are what used to be called first degree burns. They involve the epidermis and the upper part of the dermis. And there is little, if any, blister formation. So a sunburn is frequently a superficial partial thickness burn. So you get redness and not necessarily blistering. Um, a deep partial thickness burn or second degree burn, it affects the epidermis and a deeper part of the dermis and you frequently get blister formation with it. So um, I was, I think my mom was visiting um, a little while ago and I was making coffee um, and I was distracted because I was talking to her and I spilled the coffee on my hand out of the filter so I had hot coffee grounds that stuck to my hand so they didn't it wasn't like just spilling the liquid on there where it would go right off they stuck to my hand for a minute enough to give me blisters so I had a little deep um, partial thickness burn there and um, it was quite unpleasant I'll just say that um, so but that blister formation that's sort of the difference between um, first and second degree or deep partial thickness and superficial partial thickness so full thickness burns third and fourth degree burns it causes destruction of all the skin layers and often the underlying tissues, including nervous tissue and um, connective tissue. So very, very serious burns. So this is a partial thickness burn. A lot of times when you get people with extensive burn injuries, some areas are um, deep, um, full thickness burns, some are partial thickness burns, and so you get um, different types of burns through different areas of damaged tissue. This is a deep partial thickness burn, uh, icky blistering, and it changes the skin. This is a full thickness burn, that black charred look, or sometimes you get a white, you can see areas of that are the white charred look, um, and that is a full thickness burn. Um, these are mixed burns, mo some deep partial thickness and some full thickness. So effects of burn injury can be both local and systemic. Um, it, burns can cause dehydration and edema. So remember in the flu, flu chapter where we sort of said like dehydration is one end and edema is the other. Well with burns you can have both at the same time which is um, terrible <laughs> basically. Um, really hard on your system, it can cause shock. It can cause respiratory problems. So shock, the medical definition of shock is inadequate perfusion of oxygenated blood. So if you have deep, um, deep full thickness 
tissue burns, um, the, you can get obstructed uh, vessels and your, the blood is not being adequately circulated. So you get inadequate circulation of oxygenated blood and that causes shock. It can cause respiratory problems. Obviously it can cause pain, although a lot of times um, really deep full thickness burns um, are not as painful because the nerves are also damaged. They're usually not as painful in the middle, but they are painful around the edges where you go into the deep partial thickness areas. It can cause infection because our um, nonspecific barriers are interrupted and our specific barriers are affected as well. So um, infection is a real risk with burns. And the person with um, burns has increased metabolic needs for that healing period which can be quite a long time. So the way they assess burn area, they call it the rule of nines, and there's a different rule for children. Um, and in the module um, in Canvas, I have the children's rule there too. So um, during uh, healing, the, um, the burn, with a burn injury, a person needs increased dietary intake of protein and carbohydrates. So they get heat loss from their body and they tend to feel chilled and sensitive to air movement. So they need to produce more body heat and replace tissue. So they um, demand increased nutrients. So they also lose proteins in exudate from the wound and so you need to replace those proteins. So this is our rule of nines, and um, it's this diagram is not from the book, but um, I've actually seen board exam questions with the rule of nines in there. So if you want to calculate the percentage of someone's body surface that is affected, um, the front of the head is four and a half percent, the back of the head is four and a half percent, so the total head is nine percent. <coughs> The arms also 4.5% on front and back, total of 9, so both of the arms 18. The trunk 18 on the front, 18 on the back. Um, the total trunk is 36%. The perineum is considered 1%. Um, the legs are 9% front and back, which total 36%. It all adds up to 100%. So that's how they assess the percentage of burn damage on someone's body. So. Um, I was just talking about this. You get that hypermetabolism during the healing period. So um, when someone is burned, um, especially when you get into the um, deep partial thickness and the full thickness burns, immediate covering of a clean wound is needed to prevent infection. And healing can be a prolonged process. So a lot of times people require skin grafts, but you still get scar tissue even with skin grafting. Um, I like how the book says physiotherapy, but physical therapy, also known as physiotherapy in some countries, um, and occupational therapy may be necessary. So we, we might need to work on um, range of motion and positioning, and surgery can um, be necessary to release restrictive scar tissue.